Kamado is just a, an ordinary Australian that wants to go out and do not so ordinary things. It's pretty daunting rocking up on day one not knowing anything. The key objectives of the selection process are to find individuals who are going to be successful Komodo operators in Australia and overseas. What we're looking for now is that guy, no matter what happens, he's going to keep going. You've got to have that sort of internal hunger and that ambition to be there at the end. Physically, they just wear you right down, so you're at your worst, and so you, they want to see how you're behaving, how you cope with situations then. You're struggling, I'll tell you why, because your two ICs are non-existent. The confidence fades and you see exactly who that person is. As the sun rises over the Special Forces Training Centre, a small group of young Australians are preparing to undertake the next phase of commando training. Having survived the notoriously difficult commando selection course, the candidates have now been admitted into the commando reinforcement training cycle. So once we've selected an individual with the right attributes, then we put them through a reinforcement cycle uh, and they will come out the end of that, uh, of that cycle as a highly skilled commando operator. What I want you to do is first team one, so the first team in you'll start on this, this obstacle here. A 10 month series of complex and challenging courses designed to qualify candidates in the skills required to operate as an effective commando. They are physically and mentally tough. They are masters of the basic skills required of soldiers in marksmanship and field craft. And then they are also well trained in a range of advanced skills that give them the capability to operate beyond the scope of conventional units. Peak physical fitness is one of the many critical factors in achieving operational success. So a great deal of time and effort is devoted to achieving and maintaining it. As an instructor, once the guys have gone through the selection, we've got a pretty good idea of where their strengths and weaknesses are. And throughout the rest of the reinforcement cycle, it's about building upon those strengths and working on their weaknesses to balance them out and make them a, an effective commando. A commando must be self-disciplined. Maintaining peak fitness requires daily physical training, both individually and as a team. Well, in the, in the initial phases of the course, so the initial first phase of the course, everything is individual, where uh, when they move on, uh, in, in the latter part, part of the course, it's, it's uh, more concerned about um, teamwork and judgement, but uh, teamwork doesn't, doesn't play a, a part in the uh, individual phase as much.
teamwork is a key attribute because the, the building block of the commandos is that, is that teamwork. And one of the expressions we'll use quite often is team before self. And we require our candidates to demonstrate teamwork as they come through the selection process and the reinforcement cycle. Because if they can't operate in a small team environment, they will not be successful as a commando. You must be able to um, support every member of your team. You must be uh, able to, uh, to do your job within that team you know, to a high level uh, and then at the same time be able to uh, support your mate who might be having uh, some issues. Countless times on operations we, uh, we see the guys pulling together a strong team so that's something that is integral to everything we do. The most important thing I think is the team. Well, it's not, probably people probably think it's an individual, like you know, you're there by yourself, but you, you, it's, you're either in a pair or you're in a team. And it's a small team, but the team is the most important thing and the more opportunities you get to train as a team and the more confidence you have in each other, the, the better you operate. Through there, and then we do two laps with the first team back. Ready, go! <clears throat> Just as they were at the applicant stage, the candidates are pushed to their physical limits in almost every task they're given. However, now the goal is to maximise their physicality as an effective team. So we've got them jumping over the obstacles and then completing activities and doing it over and over again, uh, testing their resolve at the same time. We want them to do it as fast as possible and at the same time get the job done correctly each and every time. Going through the obstacle course, it's both physically and mentally draining. We still need them to be able to think. We still need them to be able to continue on with the task at hand. They need to be able to show us good judgment and they still need to be able to do all the other things uh, that's required of them during this activity. If they thought selection was tough, the next 30 weeks will serve to redefine their idea of resolve and commitment. Straight through there, fellas. No, 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 we're about it. Straight through there. The physical training component for the reinforcement cycle is more designed at making the candidate fitter and stronger uh, in the shortest period of time. So, for example, you would periodise and phase training programs to, um, to lead the candidate up to the specific course on that cycle. Power up the hill. We want to go as fast as we can. We need to catch the next team. But by making it this far, the candidates have proven that they possess the attributes necessary to become a commando in the Australian Defence Force. So it is now up to instructors to develop, train and refine these candidates into precision assets for offensive warfare, provided that they avoid injury and remain totally committed. Come on, fellas, catch them up! The most difficult aspect of the reinforcement cycle is seeing it through. It's a long process where they're constantly being trained. For some candidates, it's like soaking up water into a sponge. For some guys, the, sun, the sponge just can't take any more water in. They, they just get filled with too much information and they can't retain it and they can't use it anymore. Receiving their beret and being posted into a commando regiment is a lifelong goal for these guys. Stop your clock, fellas. Good work. But you've got to be ready to step up and face the challenge, achieve what is required, or, you, or you'll fail. Commando reinforcement is not just about physical conditioning. This important phase gives instructors the necessary opportunity to carve new and specialised abilities into a candidate's skill set so that they may carry the knowledge forward into their career. Today, the candidates are going to be instructed in the employment of a range of heavy weapons. The heavy weapons course is just another, another course that the candidates will go through on the reinforcement cycle. It introduces them into some of the crew served uh, weapons that uh, we use within the command. Uh, again, we assess the candidates on their trainability, their ability to pick up new, new skills and then apply them um, 
throughout the rest of the, the reinforcement cycle. So the guys will fire the 50 cal uh, machine gun, the uh, Mark 19 grenade machine gun, and the 84 millimeter uh, Carl Gustav uh, medium range any armor weapon. The latest Carl Gustav M3 recoilless rifle is a relatively recent addition to the Army's heavy weapon inventory. In late 2011, the Army began introducing the new version of the Carl Gustav to deployed units in Afghanistan. Australian soldiers were being engaged by insurgents armed with rocket-propelled grenades at a distance of more than 500 metres. The new Carl Gustav M3 is a very capable and lightweight solution introduced by the Army to provide precision fire support and bunker bursting beyond 1,000 metres in range. For, for some of the trainees, this will be the first time they've fired these weapons and they're like kids in a candy store. They get, uh, they get pretty excited, but at the end of the day, it's about these guys being safe and confident and uh, being able to use these weapons effectively. Okay, what we'll be engaging uh, from here with the sub cow, we'll engage in about three, 400 with the sub cow. With the uh, heat, we'll probably take it out to uh, probably 440, 500. Phase one, two down, phase three. You're up. Clear and clear out to you. I'm going to get my phone, mate. I know you're looking for The weapon can be fired from a standing, kneeling or lying position. Missed. Reload giving operators great flexibility in close combat. They get to uh, fire high, high explosive rounds out of a grenade machine gun. They'll fire any armor um, weapon systems. A lot of that blow up. The M3 is normally operated by a two-person crew. One to carry and fire the weapon the other for carrying ammunition and reloading. It is fun to, to put uh, these weapon systems in downrange. The guys get a big kick out of it. It's pretty exhilarating firing uh, high explosive rounds and just watching uh, the explosions downrange. Right, well, reference target seven, 350 metres, the one that's smoking. Right, 350 metres and aim at the top of the target. It should hit. Right on. The M72A6, 66 mm rocket launcher, is also employed by commandos for short range engagements. However, it offers a lighter but less explosive alternative to the M3. Designed as an anti armor weapon, the reduced weight affects the performance of the weapon, making it difficult for the trainees to operate accurately during their first attempt on the range. As an instructor, it's it's your job to make sure that the uh, the trainees are uh, are enabled properly to understand that the weapon systems they are using are, 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 are lethal. They have uh, real and damaging effects, whether it's uh, against an enemy or whether it's against a structure that later on is going to be used by by uh, civilians. Instructors must rely on a decade of combat experience to assist the candidates in harnessing its deadly kinetic force. So it's, it's our job to make sure that the guys are confident, they're safe, and they understand exactly what effect this weapon system is going to uh, deliver. Their accuracy needs to be developed rapidly because in just a few months, the controlled environment of the range could be replaced by the unpredictable nature of direct combat operations overseas. Okay, so number one, when you get broken up into your detail, you jump down behind the weapon. Number two, you'll be in the prone position on the left hand side. You have an enemy platoon to our front at the moment. Okay. During the early stages of the reinforcement cycle, the commando candidates are raw with ambition, but are mostly inexperienced in the application of advanced skills. Through toughness and resolve, they've survived the selection process. However, this final phase of training will require more than just muscle and determination to succeed.
Over the next few months, they'll be trained in numerous core commando skills and highly specialized insertion and extraction techniques that ultimately enable the commando to offer a range of unique capabilities for the Australian Defence Force to employ. These courses require dexterity, stamina and intelligence. On every subject, they must qualify at a high level in order to be promoted into the unit and receive the commando beret. The heavy weapon course has been designed to increase the resourcefulness of candidates while exposing them to hardware commonly used in offensive operations. The, the, the heavy weapons are, are just another a tool uh, that the guys get to use. Uh, yes, it's, it's good fun to be uh, let loose behind one of them, uh, but anyone who's fired uh, an 84 for any more than, in, than a dozen rounds will uh, have their ears ringing and uh, their body shaking. Um, but it's, uh, it's an exhilarating experience and uh, the guys will get a lot out of it. Commandos are trained to have a broad knowledge of different weapon systems, not just to provide effective offensive and discriminate force, but also so that they can confidently operate a foreign weapon system should they be separated from their own. Stop it! Commandos have a variety of roles and tasks they need to perform. Uh, one tool just doesn't do everything. For that reason, we teach the guys as many weapon systems as we possibly can which allows them to make a choice to pick the best tool for the job at hand. The M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun has had a long history with the Australian Army and many other nations. Australian commando units primarily utilise this heavy weapon system for its long range capabilities when employed in fire support or against threat vehicles and fortifications. Having had a long and continuous military service, the M2 Browning 50 cal machine gun is an important tool for the trainees to master. As such, instructors are particularly meticulous in assessing the safe and precise weapon handling throughout the length of the course. We're still looking for a guy that can be taught the weapon system. We'll give him a day's worth of teaching and then that next day he's out there live firing that weapon in a safe and a confident manner. We don't want guys that uh, you know, get carried away and, and, and are unsafe because they'll be gone. But we really want a guy that uh, can, can learn all these weapon systems because within, you know, the completion of the reinforcement cycle in three months' time, they're going to be carrying one of these weapon systems or uh, on a vehicle uh, firing these weapon systems at the enemy. The precise and discriminate operation of heavy weaponry goes hand in hand with the commando attribute of self-discipline. It's a responsibility that all Special Forces operators are trained to respect. That's one of the other, other aspects of this job that makes it so rewarding is that you have that responsibility, not just to yourself, but you know, to the guys around you, to the unit and to the, you know, to your country and, and the people on the ground that you're there to protect. You have that responsibility to do the best you can for, for those people and you know, for the unit in that situation. The role of training physically and mentally robust soldiers to provide the next generation of commando operators is an important task within the Australian Defence Force. The attributes that have been required from the candidates are now more critical than ever, as the reinforcement cycle is an essential precursor to a commando operator becoming competent in the skills required to fulfil operational tasks. Once a candidate has progressed through selection is now on the commando reinforcement cycle, it's about showing us constantly the, the commando attributes. We're still looking for trainability. We're still assessing the rest of the commando attributes. The candidate still needs to show us that he can learn and that we can teach him one thing and then he can go away and demonstrate it the next day. That continues throughout the whole reinforcement cycle. In order to develop a Special Forces soldier, instructors need to have access to world-class facilities, 
where trainees can rehearse real-world scenarios in a contained environment. In Australia, the Special Forces Training Facility facilitates the training framework and courses required to orchestrate the commando reinforcement cycle. The Special Forces Training Facility was raised in 1999 as a training unit to support and develop Special Forces training. It has since grown significantly from humble origins. If I'm sure about any uh, aspect of the practice, we'll walk through it in a second. I want just to ask, okay? So if you feel uncomfortable, you're not sure of anything, ask. Taking on a role that will ensure the ongoing provision of highly complex training courses and training development required by commando units. Entry and exit through here. There'll be no live firing between 150. We'll not start firing until we enter inside the actual range complex. So you'll start in pairs. Today, the candidates are using the Special Forces Training Facility to carry out an urban operations simulation that's required unremitting focus on the attributes of self-discipline and judgment. During the training, I think one of the things that you know, I struggle with a little bit is getting used to being in that stressful environment and being, still having that situational awareness around you and having to have that situation awareness like, and that's part of the whole, the whole thing is you, you need to get that point where you're not thinking about it anymore so when so, so you be going through a room or going through a compound and if you have a uh, stop between your weapon you're, do, you're rectifying that without even thinking about it so you're still using all your brain space to judge what's going on around you if you're sitting there looking at your weapon going oh what am I here you're not going to see what's coming around the corner and so learning that quickly it's probably yeah, well, it's probably it's probably where a lot of guys you know struggle a bit well, yeah, Jess, so once you come through from the 100 metres, you'll split. And as you can see, remember I spoke about the range is actually mirror imaged on either side. As you can see, it's mirror imaged on either side. We'll draw an imaginary line down the centre. The objective is to clear a simulated enemy stronghold by using individual fire and movement techniques. In addition, they must utilise judgement to select the most appropriate urban cover as they assault. Straight ahead, straight from here, direct line of sight through, you'll see a... Uh, a threat target with a white table in front of it. Does everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so this is firing point one, that's target one. So from here, you'll engage from a standing position. Okay, support it, staying as low as possible. You've got three rounds to knock down that, uh, that threat target. Situational awareness, is, it's important in operations and in training because you, need, you really need to go know what's going on around you. You need to know where your mates are, reference to you, reference to the enemy. You need to know, you know, what your weapon's capable of doing. You need to, and, you know, whether it's going to be, what, what's the most effective way of employing whatever you know, assets you have to overcome, you know, the contact you're in or the situation you're in. And even in training, like, you can't just be shooting without knowing, you know, if, you're, if you know your mates are moving through or they're coming around, you need to be aware of where they are as well. So situational awareness is, it's something that gets drummed into you time and time again, and it, it, is, it is so important. When it comes down, when it comes down to that top, when you're out on operations, it is extremely important to know what's going on around you. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll do that dry, just to get everyone used to it, and then we'll do it live. This is all with your suppressors on, and then we'll slowly increase the complexity. Instructors are still searching for individuals who have what it takes to become an Australian commando. Upon entry into the firing range, the candidates are immediately required to scan for any potential threat and then precisely engage the targets in accordance with the issued rules of engagement. This is a relatively basic practice for a fully qualified commander, but for those in training, their anxiety and inexperience add significant complexity to the task. Just turning up for the reinforcement cycle doesn't guarantee a commando beret at the completion of the course. In a real scenario, civilian hostages could be used as cover by threat elements, which leaves very little room for error in judgment. In such a scenario, a commando operator must assess, aim, and precisely engage the target within a few seconds.
it is only those who can fully absorb the training, who can replicate, demonstrate and adapt what they've been taught to achieve a specific goal that will be considered competent for tactical operations. In order to qualify as a commando, the candidates will need to be precise and discriminate during their urban combat marksmanship assessment. The exact uh, attributes that they've previously been selected on are now required throughout the rest of the reinforcement cycle. What we're looking for now is to confirm the guys that we've already identified, they've got the ability to refine those attributes, develop them and make them better, ultimately to become a commando. So we've selected them, now they've got to continue to demonstrate those same attributes throughout the rest of the training cycle. In order to graduate as a qualified Australian commando, jumping out of planes is a mandatory skill to be mastered. It is one of many tasks the candidates are required to do that defies a normal human's sense of self-preservation. At the ADF's parachute training school, they must listen to instruction, be precise and jump correctly to avoid serious injury and death. During the reinforcement cycle, we take a a trainee who's been selected for his attributes and we train him to be a commando. We're looking to refine those attributes through the selection process and ensure that we've got a person that we can develop and train in the range of skills and capabilities that we need them to perform. The selection and reinforcement cycle is designed very carefully to bring that out at each step and to ensure that it's an iterative process. So a person can't move from one course to the next unless they've demonstrated a level of competency and comfort with the last skill set. Uh, so on the course, uh, we'll quickly go get all of our gear and, um, and then making entry and you sort of, your heart rate was up, uh, you're sweating, you're, you're nervous because you didn't want to, you don't want to make the wrong decision. The mission of PTS is to train commandos and other personnel to parachute safely, as well as to develop airborne insertion tactics for the ADF. The school conducts a wide range of parachute training that includes static line deployment, which is typically used for massed insertion and military freefall, and specialist insertion from high altitude. The training is designed to be as realistic as possible, and for good reason. You know, they do it because you'll be in a situation where you're overseas where someone, where someone gets hurt and you'll need to carry someone 15 k's after you've or you, you know, walk you know, 20 k's to get in there or driven somewhere to get in there and you know, fought all day and you need to have the mental resolve to be able to carry you know, a wounded or you know, even, even one of your dead, your dead mates out you know, cause, and that's why you do train, that's why you, those things are in training because it's to physically prepare you to be able to do something like that because it, it is going to happen. Having served with the 2nd Commando Regiment for over eight years, Private Heath Jamison has worked extensively with the unit's tactical assault group and has been deployed in Afghanistan on three separate occasions. He represents what the candidates want to be and he's experienced more than most could possibly fear. During his 2011 deployment, he was critically wounded in an engagement with insurgents. Caught in an intense firefight, he sustained a gunshot wound to the neck that would most certainly have proved fatal if not for the critical intervention of his teammates. You know, you're in a situation where, okay, yeah, you know, you, you've been shot, but that doesn't stop what's going on. The world doesn't, doesn't just stop, you know, you can't just reload, reboot. It's, you're still in that situation, and, and it's not just you. The other guys are still in that situation as well, so everyone has to work as a team to, to get out of that. You know, when I got hit, like we we knew, you know, if one of us goes down, you can't stretch a carry someone out because it takes four guys to stretch a carry someone who's no one's providing security. So we trained in different ways of how, you know, depending on the injury, how, or depending where we were. And you know, we know it's always going to happen in this place where you don't want it to happen most often on top of a mountain where a helicopter can't land or anything like that. And so we trained in different, you know, what's going to work. We try this, try that, see how we're going to get the bot, you know, how are we going to get a person down, how are we going to treat them. And, and in the end, we had to do that, and it worked. So you want to train for every every possibility that you can, like, and, and often the worst ones, because it's probably the worst one that's going to happen. It's the worst one that's going to be the hardest to adapt to on the ground without, if you don't have that training in that situation. So 
the reason you train is that when you're not, when it happens for real, you're not you haven't got that. It's not, probably not as much of a situational overload. You know you've got something to fall back on, and you know you, you're not going to be as stressed because you, you you know that you know what you need to do to get the person you know back to safety or treat them and get them out, out of that situation, out of that environment. The bullet struck deep, causing life-threatening wounds. He received significant damage to his spinal cord, vertebra, and a brachial plexus injury. But thanks to the deep bonds of mateship within his unit and the rigorous hours spent training for just such an event, he was able to be extracted to safety. They, they dragged me pretty much um, down the mountain until we got to a point where the, the helicopter could land to pick us up. I was like, you know, even though I couldn't feel my legs or anything like that, I could actually still, like, you know, take my weight a little bit with them, so they weren't, have, like, you know, having to um, carry my whole weight. So I could, and because we're climbing up, climbing down rocks and climbing rock cells, it just made it a little bit easier to to um, get down. Because the fact that I, could, even though I couldn't, I didn't know what I was doing, but I could, slop. I wouldn't be able to stand by myself, but or not, not effectively, but enough for them that they weren't having to carry 105 kilos. You know what I mean? So. Private Jamison's experience is further testament to just how pivotal the extensive commando reinforcement training is. Right, mate, get some guys in here and we'll shift him over. Without a solid foundation of preparation to rely upon, he would not be alive today. The number of trainees aiming for a position within the 1st and 2nd Commando regiments has again been slightly reduced. Some of the candidates attempting the urban operations course have been unsuccessful. But for the remaining candidates, a new day brings about a new phase of assessment. The candidates are about to carry out an urban operations training activity. The task includes the clearance of complex urban terrain containing multiple threat groups. The objective is to secure the area, if necessary, by clearing any identified threat with a discriminate use of force. So with the um, MRE or mission rehearsal exercise, we um, run uh, multiple missions of what we would expect to do in Afghanistan. And that way our sort of our team commanders through to our platoon commanders and our um, company commanders can check off everything that we need to check off before we go overseas. So whether that be um, helicopter insertions, foot insertions, bushmaster insertions and everything that in between. So during pre-deployment, we will focus on you know, the, the upcoming trip. We need to train. We will focus on the sort of environments that we'll be going into. And we will essentially put the guys through their paces uh, as much as we can, replicate the, the difficult situations they're going to be in, the combat situations they will find themselves in as much as we can because once we leave Australia, then the, you know, the training is over and it's game on. This mission will be carried out in the Special Forces Training Facility. This part of the facility has been specifically laid out to ensure that the soldiers are given the opportunity to rehearse assaults, extractions and other mission associated tactics and procedures in an environment that is as realistic as possible. This is the, uh, the Special Forces Training Facility. The SFTF, it's a, it's a world-class facility and um, it, it allows us to do all of the activities that we do within our scope on our base. As always, the commander attributes will be thoroughly exposed, observed, reviewed and assessed during the mission to ensure that each individual that is selected for service within Special Forces can meet the high standards that are expected of them on a deployment. 
I want to see a soldier that is giving 100% all the time. And when he's doing it, he's, he's happy, he's enjoying it. He's in, in pain, but he's working his guts out. And he knows that at the end of the day, it's going to stop and there's going to be a reward, and that reward is, is a beret. We've had guys in the past that have broken bones and have kept going, and it wasn't until the end of the course they've turned around and said, oh, I need to see a doctor, I think I've broken a bone in my foot. The guy that doesn't quit, the guy that keeps going when everyone else around them has had enough and has withdrawn, that's the guy that we want. For these candidates, the stakes are high. By this point, they've made an enormous personal investment. Both physically and emotionally, their lives have been consumed by their determination to earn a commando beret. Despite everything they have sacrificed to make it this far, one mistake could end it all. So there's a massive fear of failure on, on any course that we do. That's, uh, I'd like to say, in the back of your mind, but it's very much in the forefront of your mind going through everything. So uh, you spend all this hard, hard work and spend all this hard energy trying to get to where you are, and you know that pointing your weapon the wrong way or not having your, um, your safety catch on at any particular time, that's, that's one gone, and, and two of them you sort of you booted and that's your career done. So it's uh, that fear of failure and, and letting, letting yourself down more than anything at that particular time. Strike swiftly is the 1st Commando Regiment's motto, whilst for us, ad monito, translated as without warning, is the motto of the 2nd Commando Regiment. These phrases serve as a foundation for the regiments and are emphasised throughout recruitment, selection and training. It's, a, it's an unfortunate reality that people die in war, but we don't want to have people die in our training. So what we're trying to do is provide training that's as realistic as possible without getting themselves or ourselves injured or killed in the process. We do get injuries, but we're very focused on people's safety. And overseas, we're very serious about trying not to get our blokes killed on the battlefield. If we don't have that training as close and realistic as possible, then that will only mean that those guys' safety will be jeopardised when we actually do take them overseas. We don't want that liability. That liability could get ourselves or our mates killed. Right, we're going to move back to the extraction point. Yeah. OK. Um, if you, you want to tag on to the back of us. Yeah, I'll follow behind you as I'll drop off my team. Once we're on operations, we need every man to be focused on his job. Uh, we need the guys to be to be focused on what they're doing and always preparing for the next job so that uh, you know when it comes time to get on the helicopter or to you know get in the vehicle and, and drive to where we're going that uh, the guys are prepped and ready they have everything they need they're they're mentally prepared to get out there and uh, and do the best job they can for themselves and for their teammate the gravity and responsibility entailed in this commitment is evident in the fact that newly qualified commandos could find themselves in intense combat operations within just a few months of completing their reinforcement training. Hey, I've got a couple of my blokes up on this compound. They got ops down onto the village. You guys want to push through, secure the extraction point? Right, get that one pumped ready to go. Yeah, just wait. Let's consolidate here. Okay, Daniel, move down. Mate, I want you to lead straight out to the extraction point. Okay, let me get in. I'll cover. Yep, yep. Upon completion of commando selection and reinforcement, and subsequently the operations that they could be deployed on, successful commando applicants will realise why their beret commands the respect that it does. Mate, this 
yourself out, Dutch Hannibal, due to the trees. I want you to take your car outside, push south 15 metres, secure a HLZ, we'll move there. The birds are coming in, we've got one more. Contact! Enemy! Contact. 100 metres! A commando's core function is close combat and the conduct of offensive operations. But I think a common misconception is that this produces a, a highly athletic meathead that is unable to act with any empathy or intelligence. And I think that's certainly not the case. I think that uh, we attract a, a, a very intelligent, very independent, very empathetic kind of individual. The candidates have successfully completed the activity, extracting from the target without sustaining casualties to enemy fire. But there's no time for celebration or reward, as there are still considerable challenges ahead. For now, they must be content that they are one step closer to that highly desired position within a commando regiment. Like I've, I've got so much out of this, and everyone here get, gets so much out of it. Like there's times, yes, you know, you're away from home, you know, most of the time, and and, it, and it's yeah, it's not the it's not the job for a lot of people because yeah, you you know, you're often gone nine months of the year somewhere. You know, what I mean, it's but the fulfilment that you get out of this job and the the self you know, the self-belief that you have in, you, in yourself and, and the guys around you, yeah. I don't think you get that as strong as you do here in anything else that, we're gonna, that you do later in life. When you give these guys their berets, you're putting your hand on your heart and saying, this guy is right to work with me anytime, anywhere, any place. Because we lost, lost three guys in three separate jobs and all of them all of them affect you massively. I guess there's probably no way to mentally prepare to take another person's life. You've got to count back on your training and when it comes down to either him or me, hopefully I'm better prepared to come home to my family.